Great. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> um, you're saying, uh, right, so two books you've released, Explosion and Operation Mayhem. Yeah. The Hardbacks come up first, so 2014 and 2020. 20, Operation Mayhem 2014, Hardback. Explosion 2015, Hardback. And this paperbacks come out a year later. Yeah, Why so, not? well, because they, they just naturally released the paperback one year after the hardback, because traditionally hardbacks, because they're so expensive, don't sell as well as paperbacks. A lot of people wait for paperbacks or even now wait for the electronic Kindle device. Um, so what they do is they use that first year to get the marketing out, get the book out there. Um, so for me, Mayhem was published in September, uh, sorry, in May of 2014. And in the September of 2015, Expertune came out. But in the May of 2015, the paperback of Mayhem came out. So if you imagine the Expertune, sorry, the Mayhem hardback and paperback were out before the hardback of Expertune. Got ya, got yeah. ya. Uh, ever taken any forays into writing before those two books? No. Absolutely not. Um, you know, it was one of those things that just came about so sort of fortuitously, if you like. Um, you know, uh, there'd been a couple of books published um, before mine. And, um, you know, I was just, I'd always wanted to tell the story. I just wasn't in the right place to tell it. Um, time wasn't, hadn't been right. Um, and to be honest, it was it was all about finding somebody to write them with as well. To be honest, mm. so Explatoon is based on your time in PF Pathfinders. On it, yeah, it's more it, it, it's very autobiographical. So it takes me basically from my childhood and why and how I got into wanting to join the military, and in particular the parachute regiment, and then sort of uh, you, you know going through. Um, going through Sutton Caulfield and then going through Junior Parachute Company, then the depot, and then obviously on to three parrot. It then sort of charts everything after that. So operation uh, in Northern Ireland with three parrot, then the PF selection course, and then it takes you pretty much all the way up until me leaving the army. So it touches, in the very, very last chapter, it touches on mayhem. But obviously mayhem came first. So it's a very, very small recap. When, when did you get out? I left in March 2001. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I, just after I got in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. <clears throat> Mayhem. Yeah. Operation Mayhem. What was the actual operation name? Palliser. Palliser. Yeah. Why did you feel you need to write a book about your experiences? It were they pretty, pretty. I haven't read the book, right? right. I'm going to read the book after this conversation. If you pitch it to me correctly, Steve. Okay. <laughs> I was half expecting you. Why haven't you brought one? <laughs> no, mate. My guests are tight as fuck. I'm telling you, ex-military people don't don't bring many uh, gifts. It now. I'm talking uh, rubbish. No, uh, Palliser, Tell me, tell me about. Ch- talk to me about uh, the op, you, from your your perspective. Well, yeah. Well, to get you there, it was, why did I write it? Uh, You you know, I think it was one of those pivotal moments. I think it was a, a, I think it's been, it's been captured and it's been spoke about as probably the most successful intervention operation conducted by any military force. Um, During, during it, you know, there were times when everybody, even our closest allies have said it couldn't have been done. The fact that the Brits moved from the UK within 48 hours into into that type of operation, a task force. Um, you know, it, 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 it was really sort of you know, a pivotal moment, and especially um, considering it was what they called t- one of Tony Blair's first wars. Give a, give, a, give a, assuming people listening aren't aware of the op, give a brief outline of, of uh, what caused the op to happen. Okay, so Sierra Leone, West coast of Africa, um, it had been descending into utter chaos um, in the sort of six month preceding that. You know, the government was about to collapse, you know, it, it, and it's not a shock to people that, it, you know, it was rife with corruption. Um, we're talking about conflict diamonds with, you know, moving up through Liberia. Um, and, and, and we're talking about the rise of these rebel organisations. The most successful of those organizations at the time was the revolutionary united front the iuf um initial estimates for the you know from the intelligence placed their numbers at around 2000 fighters but it wasn't just 
you know, we're not just talking about village village people being forced into that. What we're talking about here is when that gang, and it, let's call them a gang because that's what they were, going on the rampage, they were going into these villages um, in Sierra Leone. And as we know, you know, um, orchestrating what can only be described as mutilation, rape, murder on a kind of industrial scale. And when they were doing that, they were obviously rounding up anybody, any male of fighting age. And as a result of, of them sweeping through these villages, the soldiers that were manning the Sierra Leone army were now under pressure because their village could have been next. And as we all know, there's no more greater incentive than the risk of your family being slaughtered. So these soldiers, trained soldiers, equipped soldiers from the Sierra Leone army were obviously leaving, deserting, and by force joining the IUF, but of course they were bringing their hardware with them. So you're talking about 2,000 plus fighters with access to, you know, assault weapons, light machine guns, armour, because the UN out there, Yenamsel, uh, was being staffed and manned at the time by the Indian and Pakistani and, um, you know, there'd, there'd, there'd just been conflicts and there'd been, um, you know, forays between them and um, and the IUF. And the IUF had just taken, basically, um, their hardware off them. And the IUF's motivation being to take over the country? The IUF's motivation was to move on Freetown and take control of the capital city. Did, uh, with that... Again, taking people from the from the Sierra Leone military, did they and the hardware that you said they were getting access to? Did they have um, armored vehicles? Did they? Yeah, well, they didn't have when they came up against us. They didn't. They didn't actually use them, but intelligence was telling us that they had them because they're taking them <coughs> off the UN. Um, the UN at the time, you know, well documented. You know, no command and control. Very sort of very loose. You know, reports of you know soldiers not. You know having no communication, having no command and control, certainly having no resupply. Um, <clears throat> and we'll talk about as we get into, you know, when we actually entered in the village, there was a there was a UN platoon there with us with, you know, um, 10 rounds a man in a broken magazine and a, and, and, and a, and a really bad state FN weapon. So, um, what, so let's get into it. What was the catalyst for um, the, the task force being uh, put together, mobilised? The fact that they were going to move on Freetown. And there was, at the time, there was a lot of Western workers in Freetown. There was a lot of industry going on there. So, especially from the, from the UK side, what we what was termed at the time entitled personnel or passport holders held in Freetown. There was an, uh, there was an embassy in Freetown with embassy staff. Um, and there was a lot of other nations working there. So I think the idea was that, the, you know, the British basically just took the bull by the horns and said, we really need to go and secure these people. We need to get them out because if we don't, there's going to be, um, you, you know, like I said, a massacre and it will be on an industrial scale. Um, so I think that, um, you know, it, they, they, just, they just said, that's it. We, we will go. We will launch a task force. Um, and that was it. I mean, one power at the time, um, the Spearhead Battalion, uh, the CO at the time again, just pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. And who was the CO at the time? Um, Paul Gibson, Colonel Paul Gibson. I remember the name, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, and again, he was riding high. He was on the back of Op Agricola. You know, he'd led the um, he'd led the battle group into Kosovo, so he was, um, you know, he was the man of the moment, if you like. Hmm. What was your position with, with NPF at the time? I'd um, I'd returned back to the PF, so I'd gone. I'd I'd did an eighteen month stint away from the PF because as um, the PF at the time wasn't formally established. In other words, we didn't have the ability to hold people on the black economy, as it was called. Um, so we didn't have the ability to promote in house. So I couldn't have been promoted into the platoon sergeant slot. Um, so I was sent back to a battalion to get my tick in the box in order for me to return. So I left the PF in about mid-97 and returned at the end of 99 to take over the platoon sergeant's role. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. And then, um, so when were you told about the op? We got told on Friday morning. It was a Friday morning. Remember it, you know, vividly. Uh, we'd gone out for a run as a platoon. We were based at Watersham at the time. Yeah, so um, we weren't actually in Colchester. 
we'd gone for a run. Um, you know, we'd got back in the office. Everyone was getting showered, getting ready to sort of start again after naffy break. And um, the phone call rang. Um, the the um, the ops officer at One Power at the time, um, uh, an ex PF two IC, he'd phoned up and and basically said, "Look, I think uh, I think One Power on the move." And um, and we really need as many. Um, I think it'd be great op for the PF, and we really need as many blokes as you can spare. How many can you send? And that was really it. That that sort of that was the springboard for us to kind of, you know, quickly gather everybody in, see who wasn't on courses, see who wasn't injured, and then basically all bat as many people as we could into patrols, and um, and then report back to CO to CO One Power that we had. We basically had thirty one guys. And in the capacity that you anticipate going out there would be in a PF recce capacity. Yeah, I mean, at the moment, I mean, it was it was completely sort of. There was nothing. There was no intelligence. There was no maps. There wasn't a movement order. There was there was no op order. There was nothing to steer what was going to be happening. It was it was just let's get down to South Cerny as quick as possible. Our anticipation, like you said, was either sort of early warning, screening, very sort of uh, yeah, no, OP based. Um, you know, four to six pe four to six people in a team. Um, we took vehicles. Again, everything moved very, very quickly. One para took their vehicles. We took our Wimix. Everyone, you know, and and we just took everything to South Cerny. And then, obviously, as the plan sort of evolved over that next twenty four, thirty six hours. So we were told Friday. By Saturday afternoon, we were in South Cerny. So it was kind of rapid. It was rapid. Yeah. What readiness were you on before that? At the time, we had three states of readiness. So we had 12 guys who were at R1, readiness status one. And that's uh, ready to move anywhere in the world in, within 24 hours. We had readiness status two and readiness status three. So readiness status two obviously being a, a, a delayed and then readiness status three being anyone who's away on courses or recovering. So we basically pulled everybody in. So apart from the commitment to still to, to to 16 air assault i mean the brigadier at the time uh pete wall he was fine i mean obviously the task force was was going without it was going with support and elephants but it wasn't going as 16 air assault so we had to get permission from the brigadier so obviously ceo one part said this is what's going to happen so the brigadier had said as long as i have got my um r1 guys left in the uk then anybody else spare you you, you know you go with my blessing um, so we uh, left um, 12 guys in the UK and the rest of us went. I bet they were happy. Not. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Can God. you imagine that waving out the window? Hideous. Yeah. Hideous. Um, what weapons were you rolling with back there? Were PF you with on demarkers then? No, 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 no. At the time, and again, this is this is where we enter this, the, the sort of... Um, we were um, armed with M16s. They were old M16s. They were A2s. Um, the, the, there were weapons that had been given to us. Um, so generally, we trained on those weapons and we took those weapons everywhere we went. Um, but same thing. The minute we were going, you know, the feeling was, no, um, leave the M16s behind and take the SA-80s. I think predominantly because we didn't have enough A2s for everybody. So I think it was like, the, you know, for commonality and, and uniformity, everyone will take take a, an SA-80. What um, what did the you talk about when you got to South Cerny? The plan evolved um, into what the final plan would be for when you hit Freetown. What was so what, what did it evolved into? Well, like I said, I mean, we went down to South Cerny, and you know, and the whole tax force is in the big hangars there. There's vehicles everywhere. There's people to running around. There's no maps. There's no intelligence. You know, it was it was about as <coughs> it was about as ad hoc as you could you could imagine. Um, the operational ammunition hadn't arrived so there was very very little ammunition to go you know and then as it kind of became clear that the people were moving out very quickly the availability of hercs to get us out there in the end you know it was kind of broken down it would be a phased move so um one of the companies uh, would go first and then you know they would fly out immediately um for us, the PF, we were on the first lift, but we could only have 26 places. There was no room for vehicles. So everyone was, right, leave the vehicles. So again, we had to phone, pe phone up 
back to uh, Watersham and get guys to come down to collect the wagons. <sighs> so the wagons went, um, you, you know, which was which, which basically cut down on your mobility. So we're now, you know, we're now down to twenty six guys getting on board, um, getting on board a, a TriStar to fly to Dakar. Oh, uh, okay. So that was that was going to be the idea. Um, you know, we sort of forward mounted into Dakar. And then basically we got off at Dakar, turning and burning straight onto a Herc, and then the Hercs m- m- flew us straight into Freetown. It wasn't. Uh, it was cov- It was more. Uh, it was a covert move initially, was it not? It wasn't over. It wasn't as in we, we weren't screaming and shouting to Sierra Leone that we were sending a, a battle group in, were we? No, you know, and it, and 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 it, and it was far from a covert insertion. Um, uh, yeah, I know what you word, mean, but yeah, word. but but I mean, I think it was just. I think it was just moving so quickly. That um, you know there wasn't time for you, you, you know for for this great propaganda that there was you know that there was this UK battle group riding to the rescue. I think the focus was on just get people out there as quickly as possible. You know, intelligence was just picking up these that the IEF were moving, um, and the real danger was that you know that there was going to be this slaughter because if they'd have got into Freetown, I think that's what really would have happened. So the idea, the onus was on let's get out there as quickly as possible. Get boots on the ground, show some sign of force, and hopefully that that might kind of slow down their movement. You know, a bit of reluctance really on their part to push in if they knew that a British task force was en route. What happened when you hit the ground then? Um, so as I said, we 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 flew into Dakar, landed almost immediately on the Herx, and then it was you know. I'd like to say it was a tailor operation in the loosest form of the words, but um, Lungi Airfield uh, was literally just a tarmac strip cut out in, you know, in the middle of the jungle. Um, it was a, a, you know, a terminal again. Is that Freetown? L- yes. Lungi, Lungi, Lung, Lungi in International Air. For, so this was, uh, you know, so you've got Freetown, the capital, and then um, and then you've got the, the, the airport itself, which was, um, which was over the water. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we flew in, st- Herc, straight onto the back. I mean, bearing in mind at that stage, we had about, uh, I think we had 60, might, no, sorry, about 40 rounds a man. There was no food. 40? 40 rounds a man, that that was it. That was all the ammunition that was available for everyone. Jesus Christ. Yeah. yeah that, that was <laughs> it. And, uh, yeah. And, um, you know, and he's everybody running off the back of the planes expecting mayhem. And um, you know, and the civilian flight still taking off. Um, you know, it was, it was, yeah, it was a bit chaotic. What was that like going in with forty rounds in, in the magazine? Yeah, well, exactly. Oh, well, not in the magazine. You get thirty rounds in the magazine, forty the, rounds on a man. Yeah, what yeah. was that like? Two tw- me- two twenties. <laughs> <laughs> ah, if, if I do four tens, I get I get four <laughs> magazines worth. Yeah, it makes me I have a warm fuzzy feeling that I've got four mags. Mate. My ass must have been twitching like hell. Yeah, I mean, it was not. I mean, there was oh nothing. I mean, God. it was, um, you know. And, and to be honest, there was there was no. I mean, going thinking back, you know, there wasn't any real. You know, there wasn't any real structure. It was everybody back off the back off off the hurt, left and right of the runway, and start digging in. Um, and 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 that was it. You know, I mean, bear, I mean, you have to imagine that the UN were actually on the side of the, uh, were actually based out, out out of there as well. So you know, as we kind of run off the back of the, as we kind of run off the back of the, uh, the back of the Herx, you kind of look right into the jungle and you look left across the tarmac into into sort of loosely the Enamsel all packed up, um, and and people just staring at you, wondering what you're doing. You Enamsel. United Nations Aid Mission in Sierra Leone. Okay, I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they're all there getting this scoff on their necks, and you going running off the back expecting a battle. Yeah, uh, pretty much. Yeah. Did you dig in? Well, we didn't. I mean, but one para pretty much did. Yeah, I mean, the, the the minute the guys were off, I mean, you know, you got the guys digging in. The guys are securing either end of the runways. They're taking over. You know, taking over the um, over the control tower and and what was the terminal building. Um, I suppose yeah, because if that airhead went, then you can't get anyone out. Well, the aim—I mean, the aim was secure that as quickly as possible, inload combat power, get that combat power into Freetown, get the area secured, and then basically start evacuating people as soon as possible. Once we sort of had that foothold, once that the, 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 you know the build-up of combat power was in, and and, and over the next sort of—I mean, we got there. Um, 
I would imagine pretty much almost instantly as the aircraft as as the ground was secured um the Herks were coming in so there was Herks coming in and bringing more of the battle group just flown in so within that sort of sort of 12 hours it was in loading as many people as as they possibly can like I said with the aim of get everything on the ground you know I, I remember looking back out from the building um, and, and, and looking at the one para guys, I mean, they were, you know, they were, they were doing what paratroopers do. They were digging in, securing the area, you know, clearance patrols, you know, the mortars were being set up, you know, and, and, and that was happening rapido, really. Mm. The plan then w w was to just, was just building. Momentum was just building. CO was just, um, you know, issuing out orders immediately as to as to what people should do. And the idea being get people across to Freetown <coughs> as quickly as possible. How far away is Freetown then? Um, for us, it, it, all the movement that we made was, was by Chinook. So we were flying. I mean, at the time there was two, um, two CH-47s had flown. Um, I think it was the longest helicopter flight um Possibly in RAF history, I think, because they flew from the UK. So, Straight to yeah, Sierra Leone? To, yeah, yeah. So what they've done is they bounced down through France, refueled in France, and then refueled down in, in Spain, and then basically made the hop across. I think they, they basically made the, the flight the longest transit, I think, from the, by the RAF, um, by helicopter. Did you get more Chinooks? No, two. Flipping heck. Yeah. yeah. I but think... In fact, actually, but while we were actually in Freetown, I mean, once we deployed into the jungle, because we deployed pretty much instantly, um, there was only two when we got there. I think later on in the operation, there might have been another two, but we didn't see them because we, we spent the rest of the time in the jungle. So go on. So the airport's secured. Yeah. You, so the you, Go on. Sorry. Sorry, yeah, yeah. I mean, so the airport was secured. You've now got boots on the ground um, and guys being flown across into Freetown, going straight back into sort of, you know, sort of controlling it. So there was VCPs, there was mobile patrols going on. Um, and then the idea was to get across into Freetown and, and, and start basically extracting these entitled personnel. The aim was to basically bring them back over to, to, to Lungi, to the airport, and get them back out on CH-47s back to Dakar. So that was going to be the idea, rounding up anybody that wanted to, to leave and fly them out. So you'd get them by air, take them by air from Freetown to Lungi? Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So CH forty seven, yeah. Yeah, so what was happening on the other side so it was like a, 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 there was a, a, a bay. So on the other side of the bay, on Freetown side, there was the uh, Mami Yoko Hotel. Now, this was the hotel where the UN had been operating out of, so there was a couple of um, UN helicopters based there. Um, and what was happening is those Chinooks were just bouncing from Lungi Airfield over to, uh, over to what in effect was the grounds of this hotel, if you like, just outside the fence. Um, so everybody was being moved out of there. Um, CO one para moved his sort of HQ over there. They ended up taking over one of the floors in the hotel. All the world's journalists had now obviously got wind of what was happening. So they were all in the Mami Yoko hotel, swimming around, drinking cocktails, as you can imagine. And, um, and, and, and blokes were over there, you know, rounding people up. They'd secured the embassy by now embassy staff um so yeah there was a lot going on it was very very fluid it, it, it was i'd like to say it was disjointed in so much as there was there was so many work moving parts and there was not a lot of um uh, there was command and control there but the direction it was moving so fast and the idea was to get these people out as quickly as possible again because it, it was the, the unknown in all this was how fast could the rebels move yeah, how, how how many um how many British citizens were there? How many entitled people were there? Do you know? No, I don't think anybody okay. actually could put a figure on it. I mean, because at the same time, you know, there was also, you know you had Canadians there. There was, there was some Dutch. There was some South Africans. There's some Americans, Australians. So the idea was, you know, basically get these people out. And what was happening was, you know, soldiers were kind of knocking on these doors, these residential areas, and and the locals, the, the, these entitled personnel, were saying, right, well hang on a second, if you're here now, why do we have to leave? And short of forcibly, you know, removing them from their home, there's not a lot you can do. I mean, then it just, you know, as I said, that was when things started to really mutate in so much as 
no, no, no longer was it kind of extract and get everybody out there. Now it was kind of making sure it was secure and creating the conditions where those people might want to stay. You know, could Freetown be defended? Could Lungi Airfield be defended? Um, lots of changes going on. I mean, for us, for the PF, in that first sort of 24 hours, we'd, we'd sent two teams over to the embassy to uh, secure the embassy grounds. Um, the rest of us had flown over to Mami Yoko Hotel waiting to be tasked. And we ended up spending the first, uh, sorry, the second night there in, in bashes <laughs> on the side of the tennis court in the hotel ground. <laughs> Where was the CEO's Rover Group inside, in the, in the, in the penthouse? I think f floor five, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mega, mega. Yeah. Go on. So, you know, and again... It was, you know, there was kind of lots of briefings. Our OC at the time was was in the hotel, you know, the CEO's briefing people, giving each other, give, trying to give everyone some sort of task in. And um, so for us, we got there on, um, so let's just say, we I think it was kind of mid-afternoon, D1, we got there and um, we'd gone straight out. Um, we got moved out on in UN trucks, um, on Yanamsa trucks, to create a, a a ring of early warning OPs. But we were only two kilometres out from the airport. So by sort of last light that first night, we were in the jungle, you know, looking at, you know, two or three main tracks that could actually get to the airport itself. Um, you know, and as we all know, you, you can't move at night in the jungle. Nobody's moving. The tracks are the only movement corridor, and and again, you know that they had vehicles. So it was kind of just just getting eyes on these tracks, and then acting as some sort of early warning. While one while the task force one para kind of built up some real strength on the airport. Mm. Mm. Um, keep going. So that was us. <laughs> Tell me. Yeah. <laughs> I was waiting for a question. Every time you stop, I'm going to go, keep going. <laughs> if I have a question, yeah. yeah going, okay. Going. Um, so, yeah, that was us. That was our first night. Um, you know, laid on the jungle floor. Uh, again, no kit. There was, the, 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 you know, we'd been, we'd moved from the UK with grab bags, belt kit and grab bags. There was no Bergens. Um, really? Yeah, there was just, there was no room. Um, you know, the idea was get as many people on the aircraft as possible. Uh, so for us, we moved, we, we pretty much moved from the UK, belt kit. Light scales, yeah. Yeah. Um, with 40 rounds. <laughs> There's no room for ammunition. Right? A, 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 and a butty box. <laughs> and an RAF butty box. <laughs> Did you get that on the oh, way? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the cornerstone of nutrition. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So so there we were. Yeah, with some Fanta Fanta cola, Panda cola. Um, so yeah, that was our first night. Um, and then basically the next morning, um, so the day after we'd arrived, we, we same on the radio. Uh, they sent a vehicle out for us. I mean, the, 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 there wasn't any covert patrolling in through the jungle. This was pretty much, you know, more of a more of an announcement that we were here, hoping to frighten the RUF. I mean, this wasn't, you know covert infiltration through the jungle into some sort of observation post this was pretty much getting as many people on the ground out in the public to reassure them as well show of force yeah pretty much mate and um and, you know and to reassure the local villages um so we were called back called back into the air into um lungi into the airport and uh, and immediately almost immediately flown over to to the mami yorker um for further tasking again there wasn't any this is what you're going to do it was kind of fly over there we've got once we've got somebody there we can then task you if we need be so for us you know we flew over to the airport and spent most of the second day in country just waiting to be tasked in the grounds of the hotel um and then as things as things always and you know happen is that Quick, 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 there's a helicopter coming. Pack up everything that you've got. And, um, you, you know, so we went from being at the side of the tennis courts watching the world's press swim in these swimming pools and drink cocktails to being on a Chinook back over to Lungi um, and, and, and to be tasked to go into the jungle. Um, really interesting point at this time. So we were now all back together as a platoon. So at this point, there was 31 of us in country. So we had... Five guys that were going to man um, the rear link, if you like. So there was the the colour man and the SIGS debt, um, which left um, 27, 
27 guys um, that would be going to deploy. So there was the colour man, the three SIGs debt, and 27 of us um, ready to be tasked. Um, the OC at the time had been for a meeting with the CEO, came down and said, right, this is it. Um, the, rebels, the rebels are moving kind of from the south of the country. They're sweeping up um, in numbers and moving towards... Um, the airport. So they must have known at this time that you guys were there. Oh, I mean, you know, I mean, you talk, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, this was more, I, I, you know, I think this was more as they, my impression and, and, and my thoughts of it subsequently as that they didn't see the UN as a threat. You know, nothing had, nothing, uh, nothing had led them to believe that the UN were, were going to halt them or, or capable of doing it. Um, so maybe they, in in some sort of weird thought process, thought that we were the same, we would be governed by the same sort of, you know, rules of engagement, and that again we were some sort of omnipotent force that had been sent to, you, you know, to just stand there and allow these people to to to, to sort of, you know, push through and do whatever they want to do. Um, so I think there was probably a little bit of that playing in their minds. Then bravado, and then obviously throw into the mix that you know that there were that, you know you've got the drugs involved, yeah. you've got you know the whole voodoo stories that they you know that they bathe in in, in vats of blood. Um, so really, you know, really, really chaotic. Um, so for us, the brief came. You know, get on board the helicopters, get as much ammunition as you can. And again, over that sort of 24 hours that we'd been away from Lungi, Herks had been coming in all night. And, and now we were starting to be bolstered. There was a, ammunition was being flown in. You know, most of the service support was starting to arrive, in, you, you know, um, as best it could. So for us, you know, we just went straight on the scavenge, you know, straight over to to, to RQ One Power and basically said, right, what can you give us? You know, right, you know. So guys were just, you know, it was a little compound, you know, um, you know, wire wire compound, and it was, you know, right. Well, take the link. There's the seven point six two. Take as much five point five six as you can as you can get hold of until I till I look back the other way, you know, and 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 you know, a couple of laws. And, and see what else you've got. There was a bit of Dems kit floating about. So really, guys were just, just taking what they could get. The um, the brief being that um, that we were going to fly into the jungle to sort of the last major town. And again, I use that quite lightly. The last village um, on the route towards Lungi. So it was really the last trading point um, that, that, that the, the IUF were expected to move through and the brief for us was that um, we were to insert into this village we would be there for 48 hours um, and that would give an extra little bit of time so that the task force could round up the last stragglers the last entitled personnel and get them back out and at that point then you know, um, you know once everybody was out then, then, then the, the task force could be waiting to be to receive further instruction um, the task force commander, um, Brigadier Richards at the time, who then obviously went on to be General Sir, um, Sir David Richards, and he became the Chief of the Defence Staff. He was the task force commander at the time. His, in my subsequent conversations with him, obviously when I was writing the book, and, 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 and he very kindly wrote the foreword for it, was that um, the idea was that, you know, the RUF need a bloody nose. And we need to give it to them very, very quickly in the hope that it kind of makes them think twice before they push on. Um, and we were going to be the instrument for that bloody nose. I was about to ask. I was about to ask. Yeah. Um, and again, the, 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 you know, and, and subsequently talking to, um, to to the CEO, Paul Gibson, afterwards, was that, you know, it... <clears throat> The PF, obviously, you know, the, the way they structured the strain, the training and the courses that we do is that we had the ability to kind of, you know, be isolated. That if everything went wrong, we had the sort of SOPs to break down into smaller groups to kind of almost E&E &E back through the jungle towards, um, you know, towards friendly forces, if you like, back to the airport. Um, so there's almost that maturity there. So for us, we, we really were his only pick. Um, to do this um, so that was it um, the idea was that we would fly into the into the village of Lungi Lol which was about 40 minutes flying time south of the um, of the airport 
Um, and again, so what we do, you know, we're flying south as the rebel forces are moving from the south to the north. And like I said, the last village, the point at which they had to go through was where we were going to be stationed. So four o'clock on that afternoon, um, having received a very, very loose brief, um, we, we split ourselves between two Chinook helicopters. Um, the intelligence that they had at the time was that the rebels were moving. The rebels had been in this village before, uh. and there was a real strong possibility that the minute we hit the ground, that it could go loud. So we, we, you know, we're, we're prepared for that. You know, very, very quick briefing, very, very quick meeting with it with, with the Chinook crew. And the idea was that, um, you know, we would land, and if we come under any contact, we'd make a decision on the ground. Um, if we, you know, if we were going to stay and fight or if we were going to extract, the helicopters would provide some sort of aerial, dare I say it, fire support. Um, if we didn't meet any resistance, the, the brief was that they would just fly off, hold, stay in a holding pattern, wait to be called back in if needed, and if and if not, they would return, and we would then be on the ground. Um, what were the helis packing on them? Were they GPMGs or were they fifty cals? Or no, they had the um, the six barrelled Gatling okay, guns, yeah, dog yeah. gunners. Yeah, 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 they didn't have anything on the ramps. No, uh, yeah, no, yeah. they just had the the, yeah. the side dog gunner. <clears throat> um, so that yeah, so that was us. Uh, tw Twenty seven of us split between two two Chinooks. So each Chinook had basically thirteen and fourteen, but we had two pins gowers as well. So there was a pins gower and thirteen on one, and a pins gower and fourteen on another. So it was Twenty seven or twenty six. You've 27 of 27, us. 27, right, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And we'll get to why we became 26 later, but we we, were, we flew in as 27 um, in these two Chinooks. And, and, and again, you know, it was very kind of, you know, the, the maps weren't the best. Um, it, and again, it was very, you know, we had almost, I think we had about an hour from getting the getting the sort of, you're going to kind of plan it. And in that hour was, you know, liaise with the air crew, brief everybody up, work out some sort of plan, what happens if it all goes Pete Tong, you know, what was the E&E &E plan, where were we going to go, who was going to pick us up. Um, what actually happened? How did you give him a bloody nose, if you gave him a bloody nose? That was nine days later. So we'd been... So the two days ended up being nine, which subsequently ended up being 16. <laughs> I know the feeling. I know the feeling, mate. Yeah. Yeah. So and again, that was it. You know, it was it was grab bags, belt kit, um, you know, ammunition as much as, as 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 we had. Which again, you know, most blocks, most it, it varied. I mean, we tried to distribute it as much as possible, but I mean, it was it was it was six mags. Sorry, it was five mags and a bandolier. So I'm thinking, you know, most guys had you know three hundred. Oh, Eleven mags, then, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then the guns, uh, about four hundred rounds. Guns. We had four guns, four oh, GMPs. Yeah, well, considering the rebel force could have numbered two thousand, if you work on it, you know, you're, you're talking about having, to, uh, you know, the way that we were looking at it is that you, you know, you've got to drop someone every seven point two rounds or something. Yeah, was the math, you know, when you when you kind of outnumbered eighty to one. Yeah, if all two thousand descended on PF position. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> So uh, yeah, so there we were, you know, very very quick, loose brief, and uh, and and then on board these two, and then on board two Chinooks, you know, it was it was ninety five percent humidity, so you know you're drenched, you're soaking wet, and and it was just an outrageous, you know, Lungi Air Force was a Lungi Airfield at the time then was a hive of activity, one parrot zipping about all over the UN off off to the side, there was a little market. <laughs> A little local market just outside the makeshift front gate that was now being stagged on by one pair of guys who, you know, who built a couple of uh, sangers, um, you know, and it, and it was just it was kind of very chaotic, you know, very chaotic, and um, and that was us on board, you know, two Chinooks, and off we went, and 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 again, you know, so you know. I'm in one. I'm in one. Chinook on the headphones and 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 you kind of peering over the peering over the o over the lordies. Well, the, not the lordie, the the nav seat. So you know he's in the jump seat in the middle, and you're peering over his shoulders, listening to them. And you know it's tree tops. You you know and you know it yourself, mate. You've got the avta. It's the stink of that chinook. You know, and we're actually thinking we're going to hit the ground, and pretty much we you know we're going to end up fighting here. Um, you know, there was no information about the village. We had no, you know, you couldn't have even have done a map study 
you know, there wasn't where we're going to go, like lightly defenders. It was kind of, we didn't even know where we were going to land. There was Did you no, have maps at this point? Yeah, yeah, we had, um, I think we had probably about four. What scale were they? Own. Were they crazy scale? Uh, the, no, they were one in 25. Uh, sorry, they were one in 50s, one in 50,000, but they were old maps. And again, you, you know, it didn't take into account that these areas had been cultivated. So, for instance, the only place that could take the Chinooks when we got there had been chopped down. So there's kind of tree stumps everywhere and it, it, it very loosely cultivated. Um, you know, so it's very difficult for them to get in. Um, to, you know, so when we flew up there, the Chinooks actually had to fly around for a little bit looking for somewhere to put down. The rest of the the rest of the the village was just closed in. The village itself was was on a junction. It, it was just on a on, on a, a T junction, so everything was kind of spread around the track, um, and 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 with thick foliage all around it. Like I said, except for where they'd done a little bit of cultivating. Um. So yeah, we're flying in about a thirty-five, about a thirty-five minute flight, treetop, looking out the window, and it was just mangrove everywhere. You know the impenetrable stuff. The, you know, like you said, you, you know, you look out, you're in Brunei or you're in Belize or you're in Kenya, and the, you know, and you're looking down, and there's mobility, difficult, but there's mobility. Uh, th this wasn't anything. If you weren't on the track, then you were in the mangrove swamp and you ain't making any progress in there. You know, you're just going to drown probably in there, you know. Um, and, and, and all the time in your mind, you're flying over there and you're looking out and you're going, right, there is just nowhere to run here. There is nowhere. If it all goes pear-shaped, you know, where are we going to go? You're either legging it down the track or you're lost in the kind of mangrove. And if you're legging it down the track and they're in vehicles, then... You, you know, all of these things are coming into your mind, that the thought process of what's going to happen if if if, if there is 2,000 when we get off at the other end. Because we didn't know. Nobody knew. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and of course, then you're just looking at the faces of the blokes in the back of the, uh, in, in, in the back of the Chinook, aren't you? And just thinking, right, here we go. Um, yeah, so it was a long flight. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, so about four o'clock in the afternoon, I remember, you, you know, kind of, it kind of got to that part of the day when it, the, the humidity just spiked and, 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 um, and yeah, two Chinooks came, they, they did a bit of a fly round while, while they were looking for somewhere to put down and uh, we ended up landing just in, in the kind of, in the north of the village, if you like, uh, sorry, in the southern part of the village. Um, and uh, the, the, the two Chinooks managed to put themselves down side by side. Of course, we've got the two pins gowers, one on each. So, you know, blokes straight off, as you can imagine, straight off, all round defence, waiting to be engaged. It didn't come. So, you know, pins gowers are off, but you're now into bumpy cultivated field and, and, and you've got two pins gowers trying to bounce over over tree stumps and, and, and vegetation that's been cut down. So it wasn't a pretty sight. It wasn't quick. It wasn't effective. Um uh, you know, and they, and they were out, and then almost instantly, you know, the Chinooks are gone, and we're, we're now almost in that moment when they've gone, in that tranquility that that usually precedes chaos, you know, and, you, and, and, and you're waiting. You just, we, we were waiting and expecting to be fired upon, but... It becomes an imbogance as well There's, with the vehicles. I had a similar thing happened to me in uh, Afghan, albeit with quads, and um, the snipe with platoon were using quads at the time, early on, in, in the very first missions and um i remember mate hitting a hot hls expecting it to be a cherry uh, um uh yeah hot, expected to be a hot hls hit the ground pff, off the back on the quads and on foot and uh got the quads off ground was irrig irrigated shit and then the the, where we'd been dropped on HLS, all on the outside was a, a fucking six foot deep irrigation ditch, more like a tank. <laughs> like mm. a tank truck. You just had to leave them there. But they become the vehicles become a target in your head. They're a target as well. They just draw attention. So I mean, yeah. you can't use them in a bloody nightmare. Yeah. Did you, what, so you, yeah, so I mean, you're looking at them and you're thinking, great mobility. And 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 to be perfectly honest, you know what I was thinking now? Casualty evacuation. That's it. Yeah. Because there's not enough. We all can't get on it. So it's not like they're, you know, they're not like this hot method of extraction down the track. Um, the, the only thing that, you know, as, we, as we're as landing and you're looking around and you're thinking, right, okay, you know, if it all goes wrong, throw the casualties on the pins gowers, a bit of protection on the wagons and get them back and the rest of us will move on for. That was the only thing I, at that time I could think or imagine using them for. Because as you said, they're now bouncing over what is in effect a farmer's field, a little bit of cultivation. 
and 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 they're bumping and they're getting you know and and it's just not, it wasn't pretty and it's not tactical and you know there wasn't you know and and you're just looking at them thinking bullet magnet mm. Mm. while the rest of us are laid you know while you're on your belt book and expecting uh, you know expecting to be involved in a firefight very very quickly um so for us you know that there is that period doesn't it when you go from you know when you go from being sort of absolutely poised ready you know, to engage in a in, in a firefight to that sort of come down where after sort of five minutes, quick listen and watch, it's it it's not happening. You're not coming under contact. You're not, you know, you're not returning fire. You're not looking for where the fire is coming from. So then it becomes a bit of a sort of right. Well, let's get off this, let's get off this open cut down plantation and get into the village, um, and see what's happening there. Um, and I remember because the village, the area where we landed was about sort of 60 or 80 metres away from the edge of the village. So we're now looking back at the village and the huts and um, and, and, and everybody had come out onto the track. I mean, first of all, you've got these two huge helicopters that have landed just outside their village. Then they've sort of disgorged all of these guys running around in uniform um, and vehicles. And they're thinking, what what is going on? Um, you know, especially because previously the only people who went to their villages are, are, have come there to kill them, you know. Um, so can we, we, you know, then you basically move straight into, right, let's get a foothold on, let's start securing the, let's start securing the ground, let's get the vehicles into a position where we can use them to, to evacuate, let's start, you know, identifying areas where we can defend, you know, let's start moving the patrols out. So very quickly we've got, you know, we're issuing kind of very sort of QBOs, you know, getting people out, push left, push right, and guys are, are moving into the village, patrolling back into the village in their teams. Um into this into this village that that's quite peaceful, quite tranquil, and now everybody's just staring at you, you know, men, women, and children, wondering, um, you know, who you are and 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 what you're doing. Um. So again, a, a, a bit of sort of a, a bit of sort of chaos, really. Again, getting in and and very quickly trying to orientate yourself to the ground and looking at it and and, and right, this is where this is where we are. The likely enemy approach route. Where can we secure it? And and you're going through that whole appreciation process of of of, of, of how you would defend this village if you, if you had to. Again, conscious that you know we're we're now approaching kind of sort of five o'clock and it's starting to get dark at sort of six six thirty. So, you know, we've got to make an impression very, very quickly. We've got about an hour and a half, you know, an hour 45, you know, before we're sort of looking at stand two. Um, yeah, so, and thinking back to it again, it was it was very loose. It, you know, patrol commanders are completely sort of off doing their own thing, securing it, and, and then almost instantly sending guys back, you know, to, to, to get a brief because we were about to go to nighttime routine. Um it was at this point that um, that we got our first introduction to the Nigerians. The Nigerians had been part of Yanamsa. We didn't know at the time, but obviously so through subsequent conversations with the officer who was in charge, who spoke f perfect English, uh, we nicknamed him Lieutenant Mojo, um, Immaculate. You know, he kind of walked out in this in, in this green uniform, highly pressed, polished boots, um, you know, sunglasses, beret on, um, and um, he'd been there with a platoon. And I say a platoon, there was about sixteen of them, Nigerian troops. Now they'd been there for six months, okay. right? They hadn't been resupplied. They hadn't had anybody visit them, so they'd basically been left marooned for six months. So some some at some point during that, the the guys themselves had gone. They 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 just kind of just got out their uniform, put their local gear on, married girls, and were now part of the village. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Right. Now Mojo, Lieutenant Mojo, had obviously re retained some semblance of order as this figure of authority, and he'd decided to keep his uniform on, um, and he had a little hut, little compound. Um, just inside the village. So as we were walking back towards the village, so we're kind of looking north now, if you like, into the village. Um, big crossroads, and then just off the centre of the crossroads was like a little square. This was like the centre of the village. 
Um, and, and then obviously the chieftain's hut was there, which was like the village hall. Um, and then scattered all around this sort of crossroad, if you like, with, with the village huts. The village was probably um, about 500 metres long by about 200 metres deep. Um, there was about 500 people living in this village in a scattering of huts. There was probably about 30 to 40 dwellings of different sizes scattered around the centre of this village. Um, what, had, what had happened previous to that is obviously, you know, when the RUF was starting to make their move from the south of the country, as they were approaching villages oh, and word had spread to the villages ahead of them, these people were now on the run, um, making their way obviously towards Freetown if they could and, and this village had suddenly become that sort of that, that, that sort of last place where they were where they were going. So there was people still asleep on the square. Um subsequently when we were there and, and and as our time extended in this village and word had spread that we were there securing this village, we would have we seen over the kind of next few days an increase in numbers. So people were coming into the village to try and be umbrellaed under this protection that they thought we were providing, and, you know. So the village numbers swelled to at over a thousand at, 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 at its maximum. Um, but to rewind, to get back to Lieutenant Mojo, because he's an interesting figure, um, is that uh, he came out to meet us, spoke fluent English. Um, so, um, like I said, at the time we had two officers with us. We had the platoon commander and the two IC. They were on the ground with us. Um, so they kind of engaged him, trying to get a feel for what was happening, how long they'd been there, you know, had the rebels been through, and then really, can you introduce us to the, to the village elder, if you like? Um, while the rest of us, you know, me and um, and the ops warrant officer at the time, um, we were just zipping about with the patrols, kind of getting the patrols bedded in. They were getting their arcs, they were getting their responsibilities, you know, all the stuff that you would do on the ground when you've now gone into what you know a temporary defensive position, if you like. Bearing in mind, as we said, we only thought we were going to be there for forty eight hours, and so mm. guys, at, at, you know, at this stage, shell scrapes, shell scrapes, bit of protection kind of you know waiting for it to get dark and looking at how we were going to defend it confirming our E&E plan how we would use the vehicles and how we could bug out if if it all became uh, if it, like I said if it all went a bit pear shaped that was really the first night so we're kind of now into, into getting dark that sort of euphoria you know that build up of adrenaline it's come down albeit as we know you know the jungle comes alive at night and it's now Right, what we, you know, what's going to happen now at night? And if they come, they're going to come down the track because they simply can't move, you know, as we know. And um, so that was really it. Quite a lot of defensive placed around the track. Um, this was at the point where, um, where my kind of first, one of my first issues happened, um, you know, in so much as um, at the time, um, I was I was I was vocal towards some of the um, some of the decisions that were being made by the then OC. Um, so myself and the two IC, keep uh, in front of you. We'll myself and the two IC and a couple of, and and um, and two other guys got sent forward along the track towards the expected enemy approach um, to put in basically what is in effect was early warning VCP. And again, at this point, it's not tactical. There isn't this covert presence on the ground. This is overt now. Mm -hmm. This is completely overt. Um, so there we were, spending that first night, you know, sort of 250 metres out, out from the village, just on the edge of the jungle. So there was a kind of, dare I say it, slightly cleared area um, to the front before the jungle kicked in um, and the track kind of disappeared into the jungle. Um, so we set up a little bit of an early warning there and an approach and, 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 and just observed anything coming into the um, into the village. Um, We're so, going to um, just, I'm, I don't want to, I don't want to rush you. Yeah. Um, but if we go day by day. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Mate, yeah, yeah, gonna, yeah, yeah. We're, we're going to half an hour left. <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> time, I know time flies by, mate. Time flies by. But I, okay. Yeah, I, I, yeah. And <laughs> okay, then. Yeah. Right. So here we go. Come on, Steve. Here we go. We're kicking in. <laughs> you've married. You've married Mojo. 
<laughs> you've married Lieutenant Mojo, you've moved into the village. Yeah, that's late. it. So here we go. The 48 hours came and went, um, you know, and, and that was it. We were expecting to leave. We'd entered into a patrol routine. We'd secured the area. We looked at how we could defend it. And the 48 hours came. We now had no, you know, that was the end of it. We were 48 hours in. That's all that the food that was available. And uh, message over the radio, um, you know, you're there now. That, that, that's it. It's open-ended. A lot of things were changing in Freetown and you were to stay. Uh, oh, and by the way, the intelligence strongly suggests that a rebel force is moving towards your location. Stand by, stand by. So here we are, two days in. Things have changed. We're now starting to bolster the defences and waiting and waiting and waiting. The village is being packed full of these people moving in from the outlying villages, telling us that the rebels are 20 kilometres away. They came through our village and we were 10 kilometres away. So over the next sort of four days, we're, we're getting people in. Uh, we'd had one resupply, so we, we, we identified a, a HLS and we got um, got some food in. Uh, we got another two days. So again, blokes were kind of a 24-hour ration pack was lasting was lasting two days or 48 hours. Um, blokes were supplementing that with with with, with local scoff that the locals would, had showed them how to cook the snails and all the grubs that they were finding. And of course, Powerage power being Powerage, they just eat it, don't they? Um, so we're now at you know, we're now at day eight. Um, you know we'd gone through the whole rehearsal plans. You know we'd we'd now become part of the village. You know it was more a in routine. Yeah, right, yeah, it was hearts and minds now. Um, and then um, you know zero two forty five seventeenth of May. Night routine forward guys on stag down the trench, maximize maximize, which was the code word over the radio. Um. Everybody stood too, and um, there's people on the track moving towards us. Rules of engagement. In the early hours of the morning. Yeah, when there's no movement at night normally. Yeah, coming right. down the track. And what they, what they were doing was crawling up the drainage ditch on the either side of the track. So where the camber of the track dropped away, they're now basically leopard crawling up the two sides of the of the track. Guys in the forward observation posts uh, uh, have pinged them with it with the kite site, CWS, and um, and just waiting. Rules of engagement. Can't fire unless fired upon. Think you're in any danger. Next thing, bang. I'm, I'm, we're kind of in the HQ. We're about sort of 40 metres back. Bang. Low velocity round. I'm thinking, can't be a Norman Degler. Can't be an ND. <laughs> Just can't be. Next thing, you know, what, what had happened is the guy in the front had obviously knelt up and fired off one round and got a stoppage. One of the rebels... Yeah, he'd uh, knelt. He'd so got, a rebel had engaged. Yeah, a rebel had engaged the forward trench, obviously pulled the trigger, fired one round, ND. Uh, sorry, and got a stoppage. You know, blokes in the forward trench with a general, safety catch off, belt at 200, and pretty much, you know, targets will fall when hit. Um, so, so we're now, so now we're, they, we're being, our guys are engaging them, you know, and it, it's now very quickly, right, this, you know, the whole of the frontage of the, of the jungle now, you know, there's people moving, it's screaming. Prior to that, you know, prior to all this happening, we knew we, we didn't have the ammunition. We couldn't, we couldn't hold them off. We couldn't use the Nigerians. We, you know, so the whole plan was how do we slow them down? So we'd spent you know, time with the locals now. We got the locals in. They'd been chopping bamboo out, and we basically made a punji field defence at the front of the uh, front of the village. Oh, so we we we'd slowed them down. The idea being, if we can channel them into that area, and then just basically position the the GPMGs on them, just enough that we thought that if we could inflict such a blow, give them such a bloody nose that they wouldn't make it through. Because if they'd have made it into the village, you're then in amongst. At the time, probably about a thousand civilians sleeping all over the village. You know, we didn't, we didn't, you know, we had 300 rounds a man, um, you know, and that was it. And I had a 51. There was no HE. HE hadn't got into country. So I had 18 alum rounds. <laughs> <laughs> Here's your mortar. No HE. There's the 18 alum rounds. Fucking hell. So, yeah, so, you know, we build a punji field. See why it's called Operation Mayhem. Yeah, no? yeah, mate, yeah. yeah, it gets better. And, um, and 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 you know, so that we're now we're now waiting for this rebel onslaught. And I say, pitch black, you can't see. So blokes are firing. You know, we're engaging them. They're engaging us. The the jungle from where I was about, 
our the HQ ATAP, um, the shelter was about fifty yards back from the forward edge of the trenches where our blocks were. So the patrols were kind of the whole frontage of the jungle was spread out. We had four patrols uh, spread out along the frontage. How close to the enemy? Um, well, they got into the they got to the forward edge at of the, the punji. Start, start start the contact. Um, I reckon the first they'd got within about 25 metres of the oh, forward mate. position. So the trace isn't even lighting up, is it? Oh, no, there's nothing There's nothing illuminating, no, yeah. no. And and it's pitch black. And, of course, you've got the old screaming, you've got these rabid screaming, and, and you know, this eerie, you know, they, they, they're screaming, you know, the the, the rebels, and, and you can hear it in the dark, and you're looking out into the darkness. And like you said, there's just, you know, even the... CWS is, you know, then they, 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 they weren't working that good. Chaos, mate. Yeah, it makes it you wonder madness. why they attacked at night. Because you would think that them being from the jungle, yeah, they'd know, they'd know. it's like the worst thing to do. Yeah. It, it is the worst. It's a fucking nightmare. Yeah. It, as in, unless you're on your own or in a tiny, tiny, tiny team, yeah. you don't want to be going as a big force without any, like, night optics without any without any sort of formal training <laughs> try yeah. and attack a, an organized unit crazy and then and then you and then the bloke who you send up the ditch to start the contact gets a stoppage off his first round yeah unlucky <laughs> yeah so it was uh, and, and and of course by now we you know that but 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 give them a due you know that they, they, they've got rpgs they put two rpg rounds into the trees just above where where we were Must you know the, the, there was rpks you know the, there was fire going everywhere because it's just as hard to defend yeah, in yeah, same yeah. Situation. and their tracer so because obviously they had depth position they had depth you know they, they hadn't committed everybody straight <clears> forward <throat> so you know they, they, their tracer was coming towards us you know they'd put two rpg rounds into the canopy and of course that had just shattered everywhere um and of course, I'm now, right, what do we do now? I, you know, how do we start, you know, we've got to illuminate them now. So I've got the 51. At the time, there was um, a 4-2 commando were due to replace Power Edge in the task force. Yeah. So they'd sent a, a, a Royal Marine uh, officer, a captain in, who was come at, uh, OC, their patrols platoon. He was coming in to have a look. So he'd arrived that day just for a recce. He was supposed to fly out that night. They contacted us on the radio and said, that there's nothing. You're going to have to stay overnight. And that was the night. <laughs> so he was with me. So I'm crawling with the 51 and he's got my grab bag full of rounds with me and he's on my tails. And we're crawling out through the jungle now towards the edge of the village uh, where the fire was coming from. Um, you know, blokes are, blokes are engaging, you know, we're being engaged, it's, you know, and um, significant weight of fire going from, I was slightly concerned now about the the amount of ammunition that we're getting through. Um, so the only way for me was to get out of the canopy, because obviously we're under the canopy and I couldn't put the mortar up. So I've got to crawl out of the front of the canopy, which was now basically to the forward edge. Um, so as you don't... It, we crawled out and then got into a kneeling position and, and, and started putting illumination rounds up. But of course, I'm on the forward edge now. And, and the minute that alum goes up, there's a puff of smoke, big bang. And of course, I you, now just just become a up. magnet. Yeah. 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 So I'm now putting up a series of flares and again, pushing them right back behind where the fire was come from. So just, you know, dropping it down, keeps them illuminated. We're still in the shadows and blokes are now picking them off. Um, and, 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 and again, the hope is that we you know we inflict such casualties on them that they don't push forward even in whatever jug and juice state that they may have been in as well but uh, they just lose that resolve um so that was it that was basically a series so we had three basically attacks so they attacked us and then they withdrew in the same night yeah 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 oh. and then they withdrew and then they came again and then they they pulled back and they came again. So basically, they attacked. They, they they had three probing attacks at us each time, pushing, trying to push out of the jungle towards us. What we didn't know until we'd been in the in there for sort of the first twenty four thirty six hours was that out to the flanks, way off to the flank again. When we started sending our clearance patrols, there was an old abandoned train line. So this train line was basically led off to the side of the village. So this was, you know, this create this had real movement. So they, they, they were up on a bank, so they could have moved quite quickly. And again, so we sent a team out to, to sort of cut that off. So I was pushing rounds out over there in case they were moving up the track as well. So again, just switching, switching the mortar fire right across the front, kind of that whole 180 degree arc from the forward edge of the jungle, while blokes were, 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 were sort of engaging. 
and again, I was just controlling the fire, shouting along the frontage to the blokes, just making sure that, um, you know, only shoot at what you can see. Yeah, because um, of ammo. Yeah, and, 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 the, and the difficulty in identifying targets in the jungle is yeah, I mean, hideous, yeah, man. I mean, because they, they, you know, they were down on the floor. There was ruts everywhere, as you can imagine. Mm. There was an area of cultivation. There was little gullies leading off. Um, and of course, like you said, I mean, you know, we're conscious as well that there's a lot of civilians out there. So you've got to be pretty mindful that, you know, that there are people running down that track as well. Um, you know, that, that from anybody in the village or, you know, there's people moving around behind you. You know, we'd said to everyone in the village via the, the elder, if it comes to it and it does start firing, go to ground, don't move, and certainly do not start running around in the inside of that village because we will not know what is friending for. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and then you're into the whole world of who do you engage. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's almost 360 degree arcs at that point. Yeah, mm. yeah. Did you, uh, did you suffer any casualties? No, no, no. Um, so, 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 so we we'd gone on and we got to the point where is we'd sent the initial contact report back to Lungi. The, the the brief when we'd gone in had been that there'll be two Chinooks, so there'll be basically a platoon um, of, uh, of 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 one para on standby to act as QRF. They will come immediately because you know th th we were isolated, we were on our own, and I don't think that we, we were quite much ready for twenty six casualties at this stage. So that had been the brief. Um, the minute, obviously, the contact had started, they'd sent the, retort, the, the, the contact re report back to um, uh, back to Lungi, um, and the QRF had been had, had been fired up. So we're now we're engaging. We got to the point after the third battle, the, the third engagement, there was this kind of lull, and I was like, so I'd, I'd gathered uh, one block in from each patrol, and I says, right, well, I'll go push back into the jungle, and we'll mark the LS. Um, so we had two LSs, we had a resupply LS which was off to the flank and then we had a resupply where the QRF was going to come in which was kind of away from the likely area of approach which was back up, back about 300 metres to the to, to the to the village towards <coughs> Lungi Air. Um, so I ran back down, by now it was getting towards dawn so it was about, uh, about 6.30, dawn just kind of come up Waiting for the waiting for the Chinooks, and there, you know, and we could we could see it. Um, you can, you know, we heard it. Looking through the PNGs, saw it come in, um, and there it was, come in, land on the track. You know, immense bit of flying, landed on the track right between the trees, and there's me laid on it, expecting sort of a platoon full of paratroopers to get off, and we could sort of really take the fight to the enemy then. And um, you know, by my reckoning, it would have took about, what, five to ten seconds for 30 paratroopers to be off the back in all-round defence and the Chinook to be off the ground. I'm now looking down the front of the Chinook, looking up at the up at the cab with the two pilots in, and after about sort of 30, 40 seconds, nothing. They're still on the ground. So I thought, right, I'll go and have a look. So I now wanders around the, you know, I'm now gets down the side of the Chinook, gets around to the back of the ramp, Chinook's empty. On the back, um, there's um, uh, one of the officers who'd been another PF2 IC, you know, really great guy. Um, um, and he said, there isn't anyone to send, Steve. Um, th there is nobody. We just don't have the troops. They're committed all over all over Freetown. So basically, you's, uh, you're on your own. And that was it. So slightly disheartening. Um, you know, and and again, nothing to do, nothing to do with with him or anyone. It, it just wasn't the bods, mm. and uh, you know that the whole thing had just gone fluid, and, and 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 things had changed so quickly, and there we were left. Um, so off they flew, you know, they they flew off in the Chinook, and uh, we were left. Um, so how do you go back to how do you go back to the guys and say reference QRF cancel, uh, we're on our own. Um, the only good thing that came out of it was by now it was getting light. So again, you know, marksmanship, our position, standard soldier, and we're thinking at least if they come back during the day, there's a greater chance that we're going to be able to start picking them off quite easily. Um, so yeah, move back into the village, brief everybody up um, that there wasn't that, that there wasn't anyone, and we were on our own. Um, Chinese Parliament, you know, that sort of whole thing that, that the PF was based on is that everyone gets a everyone's got a voice, everyone gets asked what do you want to do? What do you think? How should we play this? Um and 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 every single one of them to a man, right, let's stay. We can't leave. 
we can't bug out. By now we're down, you, you know, we're now trying to tally up how much ammunition has got left, what blokes have, we've got, we can't redistribute everything. Looking at the whole defensive situation, by now it's light and all the bodies are on the ground in the front of the, in, in the front of the village. You know, how do we start scavenging their ammunition? So we sent a clearance patrol out, couple, got a couple of RPGs, a couple of AK-47s, a couple of mags. So a little bit more, but not a lot. What was um, the, what, what do you estimate the um, enemy dead at? Um, well, again, what subsequently happened to that is when we found more dead, the villagers had gone out and, 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 and people who'd been coming into the village from other villages had started bringing the dead in, strapped to the bonnets of the cars or to, to their vehicles. So reports varied. It was anywhere between, you know, we've heard as we, we went from about 13 to about 30. Somewhere in good there. Good bunch, good bloody nose. Mm, yeah. So that's what it was. Um, and that's what you know. Again, unconfirmed. Initially, the um, you know the the, the 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 rebels that had died in the initial contact. Well, you know they were they were handed over to the Nigerians, and the Nigerians took them away and buried them. Mm-hmm. We never had anything to do with that. Um, you know, so yeah, um, and that was it. So by now it was eight o'clock, nine o'clock in the morning. Next thing, Chinook arrives and in come. Now, um, you know, a tomb full of paratroopers who basically took over our positions, rebolstered us, and then kind of they kind of dig in and then um, to try and give us a bit of a rest, bolster up the positions. And then um, it was at that point that we decided, right, let's go on the offensive. So the PF, we, we, we left one para digging in, they secured the village, and we sent out two fighting patrols basically through the jungle to try and track them, thinking that if we can follow them up. In the point at which they feel secure, in their, in you know, moving back through the village, you know, follow the blood trails, and then we can hit them and hit them hard. Um, so right, we yeah. took out two fighting patrols. Um, we, right, I'm 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 looking at the time. We're gonna have to do a part two of this because we need another hour and a half. <laughs> which is good as long as you're happy to do that I don't mind because it means because we, we don't we don't have to rush through yeah, right? yeah, yeah. so you, you, can, you can just get your ass back down yet so yeah. c- before you go on to the, the fight patrols and that can we go back to um, can we go back to the uh, the first night where they where they um, engaged you were they when you say 360 did they, did they attack from one flank or multiple flanks so what happened was um, the way the jungle, the way the, the village was positioned, it had a track running from north to south, and, the, and they were approaching from the south. So the edge of the jungle itself, um, you know, there was a cleared area in, towards the jungle that we got the locals to clear as well, so that we could open up the sort of fields of fire. So they were moving up through the track. So the the, the arcs itself was was basically from east through south to the west. So it was 180 degrees that they were approaching the village from. Got you. Um, and, 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 and on either side of the track, from what we could see. And again, even with the illumination going up, there was crawling on the ground. You could see fleet and shadows, and then they'd, they'd obviously gone to ground when they were, when the GPMGs opened up. Um, so, the, the, you know, that whole sort of frontage of the of the south of the village was, was, was where they were pushing up from. mm so for me, it was most of the, in fact, all of the mortar ammunition was basically being fired kind of off to the, off to the sort of, um, to the east, south to where the track went into the jungle and then off to the west where the, um, where the old abandoned railway line was. Mm. So it was kind of 180 degrees um, that, that they were coming in from. The problem for us was that if they'd have got round to the sides, if they'd have managed to move through the jungle on the periphery of the village and then basically get behind us, which was in effect the northern end of the village, then we would have been surrounded um, and, and, we, and we wouldn't have been able to go anywhere. No. Um, if they'd have had the numbers, if that's the, what they decided to do. And again, fortuitously, they hadn't done that. They decided to just come up the middle with plenty of smoke. Yeah. Mm. Was it, for, for, for the platoon, was it the first... Um contact for a lot of the blokes that a lot of the blokes have been in or not no oh, yeah it was uh, it was the first contact for any of us really i mean in in so much as that you know that that you know a really sort of 
progressed contact. Yeah, I mean, the, the, definitely hundred percent. That that kind of was the pivotal moment for the for, for the PF that operation. What was the what was the mood like? I mean, the sun came up after that after that, those battles amongst the platoon. What was the yeah? You know, how, how were the blokes? Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, they, they they were absolutely amazing, and this leads me on to why I wanted to tell the story. I mean, you know, you're talking about a wealth of experience there, and 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 guys that had thought they'd been going in for two days, then they then they're for there for eight, then there's no QRF. We got <laughs> we're down to your last rounds of ammunition. There isn't a lot of food. We're now kind of wrapped up in a hearts and minds operation with a thousand villages. Um, and it goes back to me during the contact one girl had got shot through the shoulder one of the villages, villages yeah she'd oh, got God. shot so of course when the daylight come I'd sent the medic back to, to patch her up and that medic was Bry Bud was he really? yeah Oh, man. So he'd basically, she had a through and through through her shoulder and um, he'd kind of put her back together Got a drip in her, settled up her, you know, a mum round who was running around the village like crazy. Of course, all the villagers are now coming out of the village to see what's going on. So they're all walking around standing targets. And, you know, it, it was, like I said, it was just so chaotic because you've got no control over them. Um, you're worried about the threat that's coming forward for you when you've got people wandering about behind you, um, screaming and shouting again. And, um, and, and like you said, Luckily for us, there hadn't been any infiltration um, by people coming into the village. Because, again, you've got people wandering in from all over. Um, it was, um, yeah, it was a kind of, you know, very chaotic situation. And like I said, the next day with the blokes, you know, really sort of, you know, the adrenaline still absolutely pumping, you know, thinking that, you know, OK, we've repelled them, but they're going to come back again. You know, is there a probe? Are they just coming to test the defences? Do they think that we've, you know, we're the same as as, as the UN? Are we going to run? Are we going to stay and fight? You know, mm. so that there's a lot of questions going on, and 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 that's really sort of where we were at, really, just steadying everything down and saying, right, let's regroup, redistribute ammo, and let's prepare for what's going to come next. It's uh, we've got like four four or five minutes left. I, I said to you, mate, we'll we'll hundred percent do a part two yeah. because it's fucking hell, especially. Yeah, we could fucking talk for another bloody day on this, fine. Yeah. Which we will do if needs to be. But what surprised me when you started talking, starting the podcast and became apparent is how much of a cluster it was going in, the operation. It, it must have been almost a uh, a relief to get away from it into the village and be on your own with the platoon and all, organising yourselves, you know, and be under your own your own coordination, albeit, you know, you, you were down on food, down on ammo. Um and everything's a bit of a question mark, and but to get to get away from the sort of the big machine back at Lungi and and the embassy and get on the ground on your own was it was that the case or not? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, because then then you're back to what you are. I yeah. mean, we, we it's a very small knit, tight unit, you know, guys, you know, and then it, you are masters of your own destiny. Then what's going to happen then is, uh, I mean, obviously you don't sort of have any control over it, but then you are. You are there on your own, and and you can deal with it as an uh, you know as in the best way that that you're set up to do it. I mean, so there there was that, of course. Um, no. And and when that initial contact didn't come, and and you kind of you come down off that high on that first night, and then it becomes, you know, you then sort of in you're getting into routine. And again, as you said, we were only expecting to be in a routine for forty eight hours. Um, so you build yourself up to that, and then the forty-eight hours came and went, and and and, and then you're told you stay in there for as long as it takes. Um, did you you know after the battle, the first the first night, sorry, the first yeah. few battles, did you get um, you scavenged ammo and that from the from the enemy, not ammo, not AK, you cut the yeah. AKs and you got yeah. the RPGs and stuff. What about um, resupply of five five six NATO five five six for you? No. Didn't get any. No. What happened was the next day when one para came in, so one para came in, the, the QRF came in sort of half eight, nine o'clock in the morning. Once the position was secure, uh, the CO came in um, about about 11 o'clock, had a look round and basically said, right, PF, you're staying. Because one para had, had asked to stay. And he said, no, I can't spare the bods. And besides, I need to leave the PF here. For the same reasons is why you went in. If it all goes... If it all goes badly wrong, you're capable of making your way out. He basically said, right, what do you need? And we'll get on. And, and so we said, right, well, I'll tell you what, we need a couple of 81s and we need some more ammunition. 
Where are, the, are you on support? Who's so from one para? What on four mount the, the they were, team at the at yeah, the village? Yeah. So what we said is that if we're gonna if we're gonna really dig in hard here, then really we need some sort of real sort of fire support here, and and then the best thing was was the mortars. Because uh, by now again we just we'd got the locals to clear back as much as we can. So, you know, we thought right, well at least we can put some DFs around the village. You know what I mean? Some FPFs and and, and basically DF ourselves if you like. Um, and that's what happened. So that afternoon we got three, we got three tubes from the mortars. Um, oh, you're not allowed to say tubes. You can't. Not say, to say no, they get no. upset. Do they? You have to say barrel. Barrels. You don't say tubes to a mortar. Man. You don't go <laughs> mental. Trust me, mate. I've learned the hard way. Yeah. So we got. So yeah. So we got three barrels. Yeah. That's me in the. That's me in the good books of uh, three prize mortar. And me in the bad books. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, literally got. Right, we've got sixty seconds left. Right. Um. We're part two of this podcast. Right. We'll be next time tomorrow, down, and we'll carry on from where we left off. Right. Basically, carry on. Okay. Um, if you're happy with that. Yeah. If you're happy with that. Right. So, <laughs> this is, I've never had to do this before. It's fucking weird, mate. You've got to come back on, though. Um, where, where, so, where's, you got X-Plune and, and uh, Operation Mayhem available? They're on Amazon, aren't they? Yeah, they're on Amazon. And yeah. they're in, uh, are they not in Waterstones or not? Oh, yeah, they're in, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All the little book, bookshops, all yeah. Place. Get yourself down to, um, yeah, they're in all the bookshops. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think where they are. There was a, some bookshop the other day. I saw them. They're, they're three quid now. Are they? They're in the bargain bucket. Cheap as chips, <laughs> mate. I don't know. I'll have to go and buy a cup. I'll go and buy one of each for an, on an Xbox. podcast. you can sign them. We'll do a giveaway. Yeah. We'll do a giveaway. Um, before, <laughs> before we finish up, this is, this is proper weird. I haven't finished up without really finishing. Um, have we got any, any shameless plug opportunities at the minute? Oh, my business now, Expertoon. Obviously, take the name over it. Outdoor Adventure survival training do a lot with kids disadvantaged youth in the northeast of england now um we have a corporate element just opened an indoor cqb range the shoot house so we teach people indoor cqb with the latest sig sour rifles I didn't know about this. yeah so we've got sim sour mcx rifles and 226 pistols um so yeah we do some um we do some indoor cqb i've wrote a different courses people do um, shooting courses so we've added all that to the corporate structure we do overseas trips and taking a trip to the arctic in uh, march next year so Expert, yeah, yeah. Oh, brilliant yeah how, how do you, where do people go for that um www.explatoon.com explatoon.com explatoon.com awesome mate right part two part two we'll be the fight start off with the fighting patrols am i your first part two <laughs> no, no, no. You're the first, no, you know, I had, I, the first one was a boot net called, called J, uh, James, James Glancy. Right. Who, the first time he came on, he's a conservationist, he's ex SB. Right. Um, first time he came on, what were we talking about? All sorts of stuff. Anyway, in, in between, he was number 50. This is number 58. He was number 50. And then within, within a, a matter of weeks, he'd become a member of the European Parliament. <laughs> Oh right, okay. God, that <laughs> yeah, it come out over that. Yeah, yeah, bizarre. So you'll be the second, but mate, um, you're the first Power Edge blog I've had in flipping ages. Boot bootnecks all the time. And it just happened to be scheduled in. I have right. to, I'm gonna have to ban them. To get more reg, <laughs> more edge blogs on. Um, yeah, mate, that's. Uh, <laughs> I really enjoyed listening to you there. I'm so looking forward to the second part, which we can organise off air after we finished here. Let's do it. Mate, cheers, buddy. <laughs> cheers, Steve. Cheers, mate.